Welcome to Children's Environmental Health Day. Welcome to Children's Environmental Health Day. Happy Children's Environmental Health Day. Welcome to 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 Children's Environmental Health Day. Healthy kids and healthy places. 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 Healthy kids and then healthy places. Welcome to Hold on, not yet. Ready? Go. Welcome to Children's Environmental Health Day. Welcome to Children's Environment Health Day. <laughs> Ready, go. Welcome to Children's Health Day. You want to say, Welcome to Children's Environmental Health Day. No. Uh, what do I say again? You can say, welcome, welcome to Children's Environmental Health Day. Like welcome to Children's Environment Health Day. Children's, children's, children's environmental and health day. Healthy. Healthy kids, healthy earth, plants. <laughs> places. Healthy places. Healthy kids and happy places. I don't know. Healthy. Healthy kids and happy places. Healthy kids and healthy places. Healthy kids and healthy places. Good morning. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the legislative advocacy session of this celebratory day in children's environmental health. Um, so my name is Amy Brown. Um, I am a practicing pediatric pulmonologist with Boston Children's Health Physicians in Westchester County um, and an assistant professor at New York Medical College and um, a local member of our Children's Environmental Health Center of the Hudson Valley. Um, I'm also in the last month of my two-year training with the Children's Environmental Health Scholars Program through NYSCHEC. And this has really been an experience that has been just the beginning of the active role I play in the network and in children's environmental health. Um, so as we all know, this has been a very inspiring morning, and I'm so pleased to introduce two exceptional leaders um, in advocacy and drivers of policy change in children's environmental health. Ellie Ward, who you'll hear from, is the Director of Policy and Advocacy for the New York State American Academy of Pediatrics for the Districts 1, 2, and 3. And Kathy Curtis is the Executive Director of Clean and Healthy New York, a nonprofit organization that advances broad policy and market changes to promote safer chemicals, a sustainable economy, and a healthier world. Both Ellie and Kathy have tremendous expertise, experience, and an infectious passion for advocacy on these important issues that we are discussing today. In our short agenda for the next 20 minutes, you'll hear why Ellie and Kathy will describe these as the top legislative priorities for pediatricians. They'll discuss why these efforts matter and their next steps that we can all do together to move the needle on these top priorities. So without any further delay, I will turn it over to Ellie Ward for her remarks. Okay, now that I'm unmuted, I have to say that I think Uday gave me a great segue because what he was basically talking about is the level of policy and decision-making that is legislatively and politically driven that has more to do with the health and well-being of the families that we all serve than anything else that happens. And I think we need to be really honest about that, that any particular hospital, now thinking about um, Uday and, and thinking about Northwell, Northwell is not only the largest healthcare system in New York State, it's also the largest employer in New York State. So I just want people to understand that your institutions have enormous amounts of power. And if there were a way for all of you, because I do not work in a hospital system, 
to really push your institutions to be more responsible and responsive, not just to the communities they serve, but to the political structures that impose injustice and inequity and really work against a diverse and appropriate sharing of resources across the city and the state. So I preface my remarks with that because a lot of what I do has to do with child poverty, with family supports, and understanding that what pediatricians do is only a percentage of what creates a healthy, well-functioning child and family system. So with that, I encourage you having this opportunity, as um, Kathy said, there are a lot of people on this call to really engage as an advocate. And the reason I don't have slides is because I have a very short time to talk. And as you can tell, I'm a talker talker. Um, engage, help, help you engage your enthusiasm for something real in your institution. Being on a call like this is a step to recognizing that you have power. The question is, how do you use your power? How do you engage with your colleagues? I once gave a talk at Brooklyn Hospital to a large group of, of residents and, and interns. And I just said, if every single one of you picked something you really cared about and reached out to five other people in this room, you could get something done. We can't get it done all by, I can't get it done by myself. None of you can get it done by yourself. But there is, there is a wellspring of passion, skill, opportunity, and ability that really needs to be directed to making positive change. Change around things like how do the banks lend money where you live, where you serve families? What's happening? I mean, I heard the women talk about um, setting up a, a supermarket. That's all very well, but if people don't have the money to buy the fresh fruit and vegetables, what good does the supermarket do? And that's some of the challenges that we face here in the city and in, in rural New York as well. If you don't have the resources to access what's put in front of you, then you don't get those things. Okay, watching the clock because I only have like seven minutes. Um, I will now move to legislative priorities. Obviously, I think the biggest legislative priority that any of us will have this year is the budget. If New York State does not get money from the federal government, we will see enormous cuts to all of the programs that we truly care about and that really help marginal families stay afloat. And that's not just New York City, that's across the state. We will have major, major cuts to everything that we have built up over time. So one of the things that I'm putting on the table for everyone, not just in this, you know, Zoom meeting, but also the entire membership of the academy across the state is that we have to be ready to fight like hell to keep our children's programs, keep family support programs, keep child protective programs, keep preventive programs, keep housing programs, it's, uh, keep nutrition. There are lots and lots of things that we care about greatly that are in enormous jeopardy right now. And that has to be the first lens we look at things through. The second lens we have to look at things through is politics because politics makes the decisions. Um, the pe people who just spoke, well, especially UJ and those of you in the hospital systems really need to push your hospitals to get on the right side of some of these issues. They're all very, very interested in their bottom lines. And I hate to be so blunt, but they are. But when it comes to articulating the needs of families and children, they are simply not in the room around budget issues. And I think that all of you can do something to make that change, to really demand that they look at not just the quote unquote social determinants of health, which in New York right now has a very special meaning because of how money's been driven for the last five years. Well, that money's over, that's number one. And number two, the world is going to change if we don't get federal money. So with that, I will go to three things, well, four things, maybe five things that I think are really important. One of the things that I think we can be really active on is getting the Child, Haste, Child Safe Products Act implemented. We all work together to get it passed and it was a major victory that we can be really proud of. But until it's implemented, it's really not helping anybody. And it's not helping the kids that, and families that we had envisioned it helping. And part of the reason it hasn't been implemented are complex. But you know, I'm gonna sit here and say, I don't care. The government should pass the bill. The government did pass the bill. Now it needs to implement the bill. Right now we have nothing in place that's any different than before the bill was passed and signed. So one of the things that I'm going to be doing in the next couple of weeks is setting up an alert, which some of you get um, when I ask you to do something specific. And that will be to call the governor's office, to text the governor's office, to write an email, whatever you want to do. It's very easy. Just go to newyorkgov.com and newyorkstate.gov. 
um, and get to the governor and say, you really need to implement, implement the Child Safe Products Act. That's number one. Um, the other thing that I'm very passionate about, and Kathy knows I am, is we really want a ban on PFAS and food containers. That's my big issue right now. And I'm particularly passionate about it because the amount of takeout food has gone up incrementally during the pandemic, which means hundreds of thousands of more families are bringing PFAS into their house and eating food out of containers that contain PFAS that maybe they didn't before. So I think this has reached critical proportion. And again, I think it's imperative that we get this bill signed and implemented. You know, we can be really proud about our plastic bag bill that just got you know, re-implemented after the pandemic. This is as big as that in terms of the health of children. PFAS is just got to be banned in New York and it's got to be banned now. Um, I'm gonna say this word, I actually wrote out how to say it and, and Kathy's gonna laugh at me. Um, but we are working along with Kathy's group also, just so know the Academy is part of Clean and Healthy New York. We're definitely in that co coalition and play a role. But we would like um, New York State to, and I'm gonna say this wrong, uh, chloropyphorus. We want a no loophole approach. And we know it's being done through regulation. We also know there's been some industry pressure and some farm pressure. So what we're looking for, and I will also give you words to do this when I send the alert out. Um, what we're really looking for is a no loophole approach to banning chloropyphorus. And the only other things I think are really important now um, we continue to be extremely focused on lead. I didn't mention it in terms of the budget, but I think a lot of the progress we've made on lead and lead prevention may be in jeopardy because of what may happen in the budget. It takes money to do lead prevention and lead eradication, and the counties need the money to do it. If that money dries up or is cut, then our work on lead will roll backwards instead of forwards, which is where it needs to go. The other, a new issue that I think we need to be aware of, and then I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, um, is we have some concerns about the kind of cleaning products that may be used in schools right now because of fear of the pandemic. Um, and we're not sure that everybody is really adhering to safe, safe cleaning protocols. So I think we have a role to play in terms of sharing with the schools in our own districts. And again, this can be a very local thing where a pediatrician speaks to a school superintendent and says, let's talk about what you're using in the schools in my district. Um, I think it's critical. I think people are doing some very dangerous things in terms of spraying things that kids shouldn't be anywhere around and not making sure that spray is gone before anyone enters the room. And also using um, kind of semi-toxic chemicals because they're so afraid of the virus. Um, with that, I will only say something will be coming to those of you who get it and you all get my stuff that will be asking for concrete steps. Right now, just so you understand, government is in a kind of holding pattern because what's happening federally and because of the election. So I think part of what we need to do is look at where the critical junctions are and where we can make a difference now. And again, I cannot tell you enough how much I think you have responsibilities within your institution to try to push them to become better citizens of the neighborhoods that they serve. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Great, thank you so much, Ellie. We'll turn over to Kathy for about the next five minutes. And if there are questions that come up, please chat the New York State Children's Environmental Health um, and we will address the chat um, just in just about five minutes. Thank you, Kathy. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. I have no internet. I'm uh, kicking it old school over here. Um, so hopefully the slide is up talking about getting ready for a baby. And this is a national coalition that Clean and Healthy New York runs that goes after um, the retail side, retailers of baby and, ch and toddler products to protect children during the first thousand days of life. And uh, in that getting ready for baby, if you like, if you go to the link, you will see a safe baby products guide that any prospective parent can create their own uh, gift registry out of, uh, out of organic cotton, chemical free, and uh, safe baby products. And it includes all of the things that you, all the baby gear that you need. And it, we created this because we realized that um, what Prospective parents receive as shower gifts 
car seat, high chair, stroller, pack and play, diapers, clothing, toys. That's what they're going to be using for the first. They're not going to go, oh, dear, it's toxic. I better go spend another $90 on a car seat. They're going to use those products that they receive. So we have to make sure that they're safe and healthy and clean. And so we covered all of the uh, sectors, bathing, clothing, feeding, furnishing, playing, sleeping, and traveling. And I urge all of you as pediatricians to make sure that this information is available to your patients and that you uh, spread it far and wide. Uh, And we would love to hear from you about how you think that we can improve the guide to make it more used and more user-friendly because a tool is only as good as it's used. So... Can we move to the next slide and then we'll get to the legislative stuff. Just wanted to, I felt I'd be remiss though if I didn't point that one out to you. Okay, so um, right now, kind of like Kelly was talking about with the PFAS and food service where uh, there's another bill that awaits the governor's signature, uh, which will ban trichloroethylene, a known carcinogen toxic to the immune system, can cause fetal heart damage, and it's everywhere in air, water, soil. Um, it's the most common chemical found in, all, in the Superfund sites throughout New York State. And uh, it's, this will ban most of the industrial uses of it. So uh, we think it's important. There aren't very many known carcinogens. This one is you know, comfortably within that category. So this passed through both houses of the legislature, and it awaits the governor's signature. So I would actually cede the rest of my 30 seconds or so uh, to, you know, if everyone put themselves on mute and called this number and said, hey, I'm a pediatrician, and I want the governor to sign S6829B today. Um, I will say that what's coming down the pike Now that we've gotten the Child Safe Products Act passed, in addition to making sure that it's well implemented, which is where the rubber really meets the road, is in implementation, uh, that one of the things that we were able to manage to do uh, is ensure that a pediatrician, that constituency is represented on the advisory board that the law sets up to advise the state about which chemicals to ban in children's products. Uh, So... There will be a pediatrician voice on that panel, uh, which is super important. But that that was a big, huge priority for years, as Ellie noted. And so we're trying to figure out what the next big thing is and how to drive the wedge. And we're looking at some policies that would involve polluter pay. So, for example, they can't just go and damage natural resources like our drinking water and our air without without paying for it. And while externalizing those costs onto every other sector of the economy, including healthcare and especially healthcare and uh, uh, extended producer responsibility. So if someone makes a product, they're responsible for its entire life cycle. And it's, which is right now there's a linear economy where you extract, you, you manufacture, you transport, you use, and then you dump. And the dump part is what's got to stop. And it's often in low income and communities of color that really bear the brunt uh, the most. So we're looking at those um, big picture uh, policies coming down the pike um, next. Oh, and also procurement. As Ellie noted, the PFAS and food service where is on the docket now for the governor to sign to ban that, that huge class of chemicals. In that from getting into our food and into our bodies. But New York started by banning it in procurement. New York State money is not being spent on PFAS-laden food service wear. So um, that's a positive sort of green chemistry way to make safe and healthy products uh, safer uh, are more affordable and available to all of the rest of us if New York wields its huge multi-billion dollar budget to stop buying toxic products. That's the perfect comment to um, to transition to the Q and A on. Um, this has been such an inspirational uh, 
15 or so minutes with both of you. And I think you really set forth a important advocacy agenda. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to um, Cappy. I don't know if you wanna mention if there's any questions that have come up um, for either of our panelists um, or to conclude the session. No specific questions yet, but we'd be happy to field any if, if anyone wants to put them in the chat on the YouTube or the Zoom. One question that I had, um, and Ellie, you mentioned this about cleaning products in school, um, because this has come up quite a bit um, in my region and um, has been asked at the individual level by parents who have concerns. Um, and you know, talking to school districts has um, been hard. There's also a lot of variation. So I didn't know if you had any, um, you know, I've met with recently our, um, within the chapter three, the uh, medical school directors, but who is responsible for the occupational health oversight of schools? Um, because I think that's really something that um, we've been struggling with counseling and who to go to and whose role is that this is. Yeah, I think, I think it's complicated, but what I, what I was going to say in response is um, there's a group of, the name of which escapes me, but it's basically focused on safe, safe school environment. And they have- Are you talking about a Healthy Schools yeah, Network, exactly. Ellie? Healthy Schools Network, yeah. yeah. And then I can obviously get, give you their website and you can look it up. You can download their recommendations for what should be used and share it. When you ask who's responsible, especially if you're talking about New York City, the answer is nobody ever knows. And that's really the honest answer because you can, you can go around and around and around and you'll get a lot of it's that, it's, it's that one, it's that one. It almost doesn't matter. What matters is what the custodian is using, how he or she is using it, what the team that cleans is doing and how they're doing it. And to share building by building from our experience has been the only way that makes any sense. Because you can go to whoever's on top who will say, oh, sure, we're doing that. But what's actually happening in the school building, I can honestly tell you from experience, is often very different. So if you have parents who are concerned, um, Kathy and I will get you this link. You can give the link to them. It's easily understandable. It's not high science. Even people like me get what they're talking about. And it can be shared with families and it can be shared with parents to bring to their own school buildings. That would be, as opposed to what I said before in terms of engaging hospitals and trying to get them to understand that there's more to policy in government and politics than their own bottom lines. And they need to speak out around child poverty and children's access to health and housing and good food. There's also the other side of it, the flip side, where sometimes local works better. And in this instance, I believe local will work better. So I promise between Kathy and I, we will get you something you can share with everyone. Because this isn't only a problem in the city, it's a problem everywhere across the state where people are yeah. freelancing around microbe and microbial approaches. So, the other the other uh, organization would be NYSOT, New York State United Teachers also has some pretty good information around that. And both of those organizations are with Ellie and me, part of our coalition, the Just Green Partnership. So we work closely with them and we can get you some contacts there. Great. Like Veronica, Veronica, the health and safety representative from NYSA, for example. But what we give you, you must promise to share. I promise. I will okay. share widely. And I okay. hope everyone else will as well. Um, thank you. Were there any other questions or comments from participants? Hi, this is Maida Gildas. That was fabulous. Thank you both. Um, I have a question for you. So, Hi, Maida. Hi, Ellie. Hey, yeah, Maida. Um, so Apernable really showed us sort of how you can be a powerful force for change as a clinician, a community pediatrician specifically. And for the trainees that are on the call right now, do you have advice for how they can get there um, in terms of the tools that she needed to have at the ready in order to be an effective change maker in her community? Um, can you give us uh, a I I will say two things. One, you're kind of breaking up, so I didn't exactly get what you asked, so that's hard for me to answer. Um, but if what you're talking about is how does a community pediatrician engage around these issues in a proactive and effective way, which might be what you asked. Exactly, and get trained oh. to do that, essentially. Okay. Um, I think there are lots of people on this call who could help train them. That would be my first answer. Um, 
but I do think there is a sense in which, and I think both of the previous speakers mentioned this, that we need to look beyond ourselves. We need to look for partners in the community. We need to look for people who want and can help us extend. We bring, as pediatricians, and I can't say me because as Maida knows, I am not a doctor, um, but what you bring is you bring a certain perspective, but the mom that engages with you brings her perspective and the teacher that engages with you brings his or her perspective and the landlord that you engage with brings their perspective. And I think it's teaming up, understanding your community, getting a sense of what it is they need and what it is you can help them organized to provide and what is the process to get there is the way this gets done. I don't think anyone can of, ever do this alone. In terms of advocacy though, uh, Clean and Healthy New York already provides advocacy training uh, for residents as part of their regular, you know, instruction and residency for Albany Medical Center and uh, upstate medical centers, children's environmental health centers there. So we're happy to do that for any pediatricians anywhere, anytime, uh, about and, how to advocate. Yeah, and so all the we, residency programs have those have have an advocacy track. That's right, different right. when you get into the community and you actually want to figure out how you're going to make change. Absolutely, not either or, but just added, adding that to your wisdom, Ellie. I don't have wisdom. I just have ideas. So that's my offer. Yeah, and just, you know, a final comment that sort of um, you all have been tremendous voices for advocacy for children in the state and for the country um, and really appreciate your leadership. Um, and we've seen firsthand how when we all speak with have a profound impact um, and lead to some success on the legislative and policy side. So. Thank you for all you do for children. Okay, all I'm gonna say is I'm gonna need every single voice when it comes to the budget. So get ready. Get ready to be our allies with everyone else. Yeah, and also say that uh, when I spoke to this group last year, I asked everybody to call the governor about the Child Safe Products Act and it worked. He signed it. So again, I'll urge you to call him about TCA and Ellie's advocacy as well, that she, her topics. Great. Well, thanks to you both. Um, I'll turn it over to, um, I see that Lauren started screen sharing. So um, I guess I'll turn it over to Lauren now to wrap up. So just like we, we open this morning's session um, from the words from kids around New York State, we're gonna end this session with another video. And just as a reminder, the Children's Environmental Health Day celebration continues. Um, if you go to nicecheck.org, you'll have information on the 12 p.m. Twitter chat and the 4 p.m. Instagram live conversation between Luz Guell and Jen Abreu about colonialism, COVID, and environmental racism. So I hope you're able to participate in those. And with that, I turn it over to the kids. A healthy environment means fun outdoor activities. A healthy environment means a healthy city and, and healthy people. A healthy environment means, one, to not throw garbage in the sea because then it will kill animals in the sea. Two, do not throw garbage on the floor because it will kill trees, flowers, and plants. And three, let's clean up, we need to clean up the garbage so we can have a healthy and clean environment. Puppy, fun means playing. A healthy environment to me means um, a lot of non-polluted air, not a lot of cars driving up and down the streets, and a lot of people running and biking. Healthy environment means eating pickles and cucumbers. A healthy environment means don't throw stuff in the ocean. A healthy environment means healthy fruit. A healthy environment means to me that where there's a place of a lot of greenery.